<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Vox Vomitus. I am your host, Jennifer Ann Gordon, the author of the Kindle award-winning novel, Beautiful, Frightening, and Silent, as well as Pretty Ugly and the Hotel series. Joining me today, as always, is my Vox Vomitus vixen, Alison Martine, author of The Bourbon Books, which includes okay. dibs since September, Move on Melinda, and Climb the Salmon Ladder. I'm trying to be copying your cover, Lily, but I this is just ridiculous. I'm going back to being able to see. Let's do this. Got it. <laughs> All right. And our guest today is author Lily Chu. She is the author of the Audible original, The Comeback. I am also trying to sport the, the cover <laughs> of The Comeback. See, um, if we combined us with these glasses and that hat, we are Ariadne. That's a little I, okay. I, I almost put on my sunglasses, but. And these are prescription and are probably easier to see, but I look so ridiculous. <laughs> oh, and you're wearing the mask. I've which got, I I got my K-pop idol airport mask look, so. Perfect, perfect. So all together, <laughs> we are cosplaying as the characters in your book, The Comeback. Welcome, Lily. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for having me. Now that I have the hat on, I feel like I, I have to commit to it. Yeah. It's a good hat. That's now but your it's, life. You are living the hat lifestyle, Jen. Just embrace it. I am. I might, <laughs> I might lose it because every time I wear a hat in the house, my dog gives me this look like, are we going O-U-T? <laughs> now I'm just going to start spelling the rest of the episode. So, <laughs> Lily, welcome to Vox Vomitus. Tell our viewers and our listeners a little bit about yourself and then a little bit about the comeback. Of course. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Lily. I am a romance writer who lives here in Toronto. Um, my first book is The Stand-In. My second book is called The Comeback, and it's about an ambitious lawyer who falls in love with a K-pop idol. And it's set partly in Toronto and partly in Seoul, Korea. It's a rom-com, um, I should say. <laughs> it's a rom-com. It's, it's a rom-com, rom but it also looks at, um, you know, uh, ideas Family. about expectation yeah. and celebrity and you know who what you owe other people and finding yourself um and you also don't have to like k-pop to like it ari the main character at the beginning of the book not a k-pop <laughs> fan she's like what is this thing um <laughs> all right i can't but, see <laughs> which i feel like ari kind of stands in for a lot of americans over the last five to ten years where all of a sudden k-pop was everywhere and children are showing up with like the bts shirts and their yeah. parents are like is I'm that a confused. gang thing <laughs> i don't you know because one of my friend's eldest children has it so she's like super super into it and my husband is a teacher and most of his kids know it so i'm going okay i get this by association but our generation we just completely missed it and i'm assuming it existed for not more than five minutes but yeah, it just completely didn't get over here, and now it's just like, oh yes, we rule the world, and we are bigger than the Beatles. Get with it. Yeah, I know my husband. I think was into it. I think he, he'll probably watch this and go, oh, I wasn't into K-pop. He's going to deny he, it later. <laughs> he did. Uh, we did watch some Korean dramas when mm -hmm. we were first courting because he was unabashedly obsessed with Korean drama. They are amazing, amazing. They're so like, at first I was just like, oh, it's like a soap opera. And Roman's like, no, you don't get it. You're it is it's a, a specific out. vibe. So then, yeah, I did commit and watch a couple of them. I think one about like rival bakers. And then I love it. That's just like, that could also be a rom-com. So Lily, yeah. if you just need to start going through ideas, just See what the Korean dramas have because they're oh, something pretty awesome. They are amazing. They're just so emotional. Mm -hmm. um, There's a lot of like quivering lips and longing, long like long looks, longing looks, and just like <laughs> just um, uh, angst. Yeah, I love them. Love them. Well, and I like want countertops covered with flour and just you know. <laughs> okay, I was picturing flowers, but now we're back to bakers. And we're we back to baking. The ground <laughs> weed. I get it now. I'm like, oh, different flowers. We're not crushing flower petals. <laughs> no, I was going to ask about your inspiration for Ari, because if it weren't for the fact that I've never been to Toronto and I'm not Asian, I'm going, oh, is, is Ari secretly me? This lawyer well, I thought like, I was I reading I don't really necessarily Allison. want to be a lawyer, but my parents made me do the thing instead of the thing that I want to do, yeah. because the thing I want to do doesn't actually pay me money. I think Ari is um, very relatable in that way. Um, I'm pretty lucky that my family didn't really pressure me to uh, 
have you a know, real job. Be a, I, you know what? Until Friday, I had a real job. Um, and now I'm, I, I hunt over a computer and write books. Um, but, you know, there weren't, you have to be a doctor, you have to be a lawyer. In fact, I wanted to be a lawyer until I realized that I would make a terrible lawyer. Um, but there, you know, I feel a lot of us do have a sense of if it's not your job, it's where you live or it's, you know, who your partner is, or there are a lot of expectations on people in general about how other people want them to live. Um, and Ari really wants to make her dad happy. You know, she really wants to fill that, that gap in his life. And she wants to, uh, she, he, she wants him to be proud of her. Um, which I think many of us experience with the people. Oh Yeah. Proud. So and yeah, especially that dynamic, that relationship between fathers and daughters, I feel like there are so we would all say that, like, I grew up with that whole, I just want to make my dad proud. I want to make my dad proud. And then you end up making the weirdest life choices. Yep. Okay. But I just have to say, like, oh, what am I doing? after I passed the bar and I got my first job, my, my father found out I would be working for a personal injury law firm. And he's like, oh, so you're going to be an ambulance chaser. My dad, everyone. Thank <laughs> Yeah, so maybe not all of our choices, even if we think these are the ones that are going to make them proud and that making them proud anyway, because you can never quite get there. You can never quite get there. I went to school for theater and my dad was like, you're just going to become a secretary. Um, <laughs> so, but you I never had a, be a tour guide. Yeah. I'm like, I'm going to be a tour guide. He's like, and that's actually, he hung up the phone on me. <laughs> that's the only time he's ever hung up the phone on me. He hung up the phone on no. you? I got the full phone hang up. And then I was like, you know is that a viable career option long-term? Uh, so then I became an archeologist, which- Oh yeah, which is a big money maker. Absolutely. I mean, sure. You know, I, I Indiana always think Jones, being, all the money. All the yeah. money. Um, but he also had that job as a professor for you know the health insurance. I know, so, and when the girls do yeah. the, I love you blinking yeah. down. Oh, this is a good way to show off my orange. I forgot about that scene. Remember oh. that? That's amazing. We haven't shown our kids yet, but- my eldest were like, oh, yeah, well, we'll find it for you somewhere. We have it like on VHS, but we don't have a VHS player anymore. Yeah. And we're just like trying to think back how many inappropriate scenes are there? We're going to have a hard time explaining to her. All, all, probably all of them because of it. it was filmed in the 80s. And yeah. it was when we, you know, everything was inappropriate in the 80s. Yeah. And we were fine with that. And we turned out more or less traumatized. More or less. Okay. Well, I always think being a tour guide is going to be my retirement job. Like I'm going to move someplace exotic and I'll give the tours in English because I, of course, don't speak any other languages because I'm from the United States. <laughs> I, there are two languages in my country and I can barely handle English. So I was going to say, okay, are you, are you fluent in French too? I am fluent in nothing. Like All right. English, I in English. Yeah. Um, I've, I'm, I've got some mastery over, but I took uh, Mandarin in university. I got a D. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I had to take French all through school. Yeah, you had no choice. Yeah. And I, you know, if I go to Paris or something, I can, if I speak very slowly, very slowly, and there's a lot of hand <laughs> motions, Just um, I can, I can kind of get the gist of the museums to the left. Oh, that's yeah. good. They so, just point. So yeah. my my mother is French Canadian and I grew up with her speaking French. I don't speak French. Oh. I went to French Catholic school, had to take French, don't know any of it anymore. Like my body just was like, you're not going to learn this. <laughs> don't even try. Just I wish I was a language person. I, you know, I wish I was one of those people who was loved languages, was great with languages, but I'm just I'm really not. Oh, and I'm I'm not either, but I also beat myself up for some really stupid decisions along the way, including the fact that my one kind of early chance to travel abroad was in high school and I was going on a biological expedition Ooh. and I've been studying Spanish. So how do I decide where to go? I picked the one country in South America that speaks Portuguese. That was brilliant. And I'm down there and things that I can go ahead and read. If I could read it, I could pretty much figure it out because it looks enough like I hear it. I'm like, I'm certain that's French. I don't know where we are, but that's French because Portuguese and French sound the same to me because I can't speak either one of them. I can't even pronounce most of the names from Les Miserables, including the name of the musical. <laughs> well, and Christian wants us to be speaking dead languages. Christian, nobody wants a tour in a dead language. Etruscan yeah. is not something that people are going to be clamoring for, but you want to do it, knock yourself out. And I took Latin, again, in my vast attempt to just not learn the language that my mother spoke fluently. Um, and, you know, what I learned in Latin, all the sentences are like, the farmers are poets. 
The, the <laughs> slaves are farmers. <laughs> you know? I don't see how that's helpful. Yeah, I'm like, I'm never going to use this in conversation. <laughs> well, and I was once berated for not having taken Latin because they're like, well, you're going to law school. Didn't you need to take Latin? Nobody I know who went to law school took Latin. Half of us <laughs> sort of passed Spanish. And there are probably a few people who native language was something other than English. But Latin was not anyone's native language. Thank you. No, <laughs> no none of us. None of us. I wish I spoke Korean and not just because that way I would know what certain extended family members. My sister's, my sister's husband is Korean. And so that whole side of the family is Korean. And sometimes when they get like family members all over it goes back and forth and you have no idea if you were just asked to go put the rolls in the oven or get the rolls out of the oven. And hopefully you didn't just burn the rolls because I don't even know if I was being addressed. <laughs> the important thing there is though, that there's always kimchi in my fridge. And I was, well, since my sister moved to Texas, oh, lucky. I have not had good kimchi since then because I'm just buying what's sold at Stater Brothers and it's not the same. <sighs> and kimchi is so delicious. It is. I, I still eat a lot of it, but it's, it's not the same as like, Hey, so-and-so's grandma brought it over. Yeah. Again, Nothing, nothing home. Nothing cooked. beats homemade. It doesn't. It just, it doesn't. And if I went on a tour, I would go find, like, I would want the tour to just take me to everybody's grandmother's house in every country. Like, grandma. Be in a basement abuela, tour. Wait, who do we have here? That would be a fun tour. Yeah, would be so fun. Take, me, take me to Harabaji's place and I can mm -hmm. have some really good food. I'd go on that <laughs> tour. I'd go with you. Yeah. I would like it to be um, grandma's haunted house, though. <laughs> Haunted by grandma or grandma lives there. In the I'm house. fine with either. I'm fine, fine with, with either. either. Fine with either. Yeah. Yeah. So Lily, tell us a little bit about how this whole thing gets started with this rom-com. This, okay, just to start, it is audible only. So everybody gets to listen, has to listen to, gets to listen to Philip <laughs> too, which is amazing. She's and a great I'm, narrator. I'm an audible oh, addict. Yeah. And so when I'm like, ooh, free book from rom-com clicking, I didn't I didn't know that this was going to be also Philippa Sue. And then I fell in love with the book. Um, and not just because I'm like Ariadne is is my my spirit sister here in terms of kind of upbringing. But tell us about how Ariadne meets the love of her life that just shows up in her living room. All right. So uh, Ariadne is a lawyer, so she works long days. And uh, she's had a not great day at work, as I think most days at work tend to be. <laughs> yeah. So she comes home. Her roommate is away uh, on a work trip. And all she wants to do is chill out because she still actually has a few hours of work left to do. And she's got to do laundry. And everything's just a mess. And she comes home. And there's a guy on her couch. A super hot guy. Who might be a serial killer. Who did not expect a guy on her couch, hot or not. Doesn't this matter. Wasn't supposed to be there. Definitely going to interfere with her laundry plans. Um, <laughs> so she's really unhappy about the whole thing. And it turns out that it's Jihoon, who is her, her, her roommate's cousin, who has just had a brutal breakup and just needed to get away. And, oh, by the way, he's going to be staying in my room. Hope you don't mind. So sorry I didn't tell you. Oops. Yeah, it's my I, bad. I, yeah, I think I, this is why it's good that your book was set in Canada and not in the United States, specifically maybe like Texas, because she just would have shot him, and then there wouldn't oh have been. <laughs> That's it. There's a strange man here. Shoot first, ask questions. I Canada, would, no, we just yes. have to stop and say sorry a lot. That I uh, that did not cross my mind as a, a plot option to be American. honest. Uh, yeah, I, it, it crossed my mind because I, I lived in the Midwest for quite some time, and that was also a. Uh, shoot first, ask questions mm -hmm. later. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, thank God she doesn't have a gun. Yeah, no, that is, <laughs> nope. <laughs> I'm like, oh, it was a short story. It was really yeah. just like a, a short Didn't poem of a book. Twist coming. Yeah, like, oh, that. and then she killed him. That sounds like something but, I would write. And honestly, <laughs> what she wants to kill is where rom-com goes in the first chapter. Yeah, no, <laughs> like, no. You know, I don't want to make a blanket mm -hmm. statement about rom-coms, but the mute cute usually doesn't end up with, with death. Yeah, with, with death. Yeah. Well, then we get into the whole. Well, is the happily ever after required? Yes. And yes. Second, you can't just kill off. You can't have one of your love interests killing the other one. That is not a rom com, guys. It's just not. No, you know, unless you know, unless it was all a big ploy to get uh, the hot cop to come over. Oh no, nobody it's wants to be bad ploy. That's <laughs> bad ploy. Another way. Um, mortician. No. He sees the story, and then they the the ghost is there, and they fall in love. Yes. Which again, kind of a roundabout. Maybe you could just fall in love yeah. with a living person. Um, I think that. Like yeah, but then like you wouldn't have the angst. 
the longing. Oh, I'm in love with a ghost. And, you know, like, yeah. that's not really going to be hot when we're like trying to have the sexy time. True. I know. Patrick Swayze. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> no, but I saw that movie, weirdly. I would, okay, we need to get you to go see I it. I never saw that movie. It's, it's, but I know the scenes, like, you know, culturally, the scenes are just so. Yeah. We've, like, we've seen there. them and we've seen them made fun of enough that you don't actually have to see them. You're like, ah, you get the gist of it. <laughs> I get the whole idea. I'm like. And for the record, if I were her, I would probably be less likely to shoot the guy on the couch because I'd be panicking. But I would shoot the roommate when she gets home for putting me in that position. <laughs> she, oops. Yeah, she was not happy. She was, yeah, Definitely she's looking. Happy. she wasn't. I don't think she was even in the country at that point. Uh, she was in. She was on the other side of the country. Yeah, she was in like Vancouver. Yeah, yeah, near the airport. So she was out of um, out of reach. Yeah. out of slapping distance. Yeah, but she does love her her roommate slash best friend. So, um, and it turned out okay for her, I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, not too bad. <laughs> he ended up being, you know, kind okay. of a cool guy. Yeah, well, and I don't, I don't want to spoil too much because. I knew going in based on what it said. Can can we spoil why Ji Hoon is there? I don't want to say too no, much. No, we cannot. I, I will not say why Ji Hoon is there, <laughs> but I will say that the idea of this guy who's just like, oh, I'm not going to get in your way, but now I'm making ramen in your kitchen, and oh, by the way, I'm just like kind of hanging out. How can anybody not get in your way and be living in your apartment for any like good time? Like, he's still there. I can't he's just walk there. around without a bra on and my hair yeah. up. This it's definitely. Different people have different comfort levels with people yeah. in their space. Me, for instance, more like Ari. Why are you here? Why yep. are you still here? You're breathing. This is a problem. Like, <laughs> Could you not yeah. do that? What's going on? Um, Jihoon, on the other hand, loves it. Like, loves people, loves being with people, is used to being surrounded by people. Um, you know, so they they do have different comfort levels. They do. Um, um, I was going to say, um, you gave um, your main character a really great, um, I don't want to say hobby, but character trait, which is something weirdly I do, which is I just plan trips mm. to relax myself. Yep. Um, so when I first started listening, I was like, oh, this is a, clearly a book about Allison, a lawyer. <laughs> and then all of a sudden when it got to the travel journals and sometimes I just plan trips to relax, I'm like, oh. <gasps> that's what I do. Like there are times that I just, when I need to turn off my brain, I go to Expedia and I just yeah. start like plugging in dates and cities. Where could you go? Where could I go? How much would that cost? Where would I stay? <laughs> yeah. And in an airport, I love looking at the, um, the board, you know, it's like, I could go to Sao Paulo. I could go to Tokyo. I could go, you could just get on a plane and go anywhere. And, yes. and I wrote it when this pandemic was still on. So I wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. So we were um, all just honestly, sadly with our travel notebooks. Yeah. Going, Imagine exactly. going to Budapest. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that's one of the sad things about Ariadne when we started is like because she is so literally married to her job, she hasn't done any of these trips. Yeah. She's done them for everybody else. So like Jen, Jen loves to travel. Jen does these things. So I can I see it as almost like, <laughs> oh, and then I'll go and do this. But Poor Ariane is like, yeah, are you ever going to go? Do you get to go do anything ever? Yeah. Yeah. I tried to pick um, something that was really going to be a foil for her. Like, I, because at the time for me, the most broadening thing I could think of was travel. Like it was going somewhere and experiencing new things. Um, you know, I could have put her into like, you know, ultimate Frisbee or, or something. <laughs> um, That'd be a very different book too. Yeah. Very different yeah. book. <laughs> Uh, but I wanted her to have a hobby that was just so filled with yearning um, mm -hmm. and this sense of missing out that I'm like, travel, that's it. it well, especially at the height of the pandemic, I feel like so uh -huh. many of us read or wrote to escape. And it was funny because I know we started this podcast during the pandemic and the fact that we had so many authors come on who are like, well, I don't really know how to launch a book when I can't go into a bookstore or see yeah. anybody. So there was that aspect. But then we've also talked to so many who are like, well, I normally would travel to do my research and I can't go anywhere and I can't see any of this stuff. So yep. I'm pulling stuff out of my head. So I think travel was the ultimate thing, especially during the pandemic of the yearning of that yeah. thing we can't attain. Yeah. And I was, I really thought that uh, I really wanted the research trip to Seoul. Like I was desperate to go there because you know you can look online but there's something about being in a place and the smells and the experiences that you know it just it's 
it's more visceral when you're there and you're like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. um, and that didn't happen like that obviously didn't happen, but I found a great website where, oh, what's it called? It's called, I can only remember what it's called, but basically you go on walks through cities. Like someone's got a GoPro where they just got their camera, nice. their phone. I love that. And it's just, and it's not hitting the tourist spots. It's like them in a back alley getting a burger or it's them, you know, getting off the bus or in a subway station, just the everyday kind of parts of life, like their commute or um, where they went shopping for a pair of pants. It was fascinating. I'm just glad when you finished that first sentence about in the back alley, it wasn't getting mugs. I think I'm still back on the, the violence part Ooh, again. You're still oh, in the violence part of it. There was, <laughs> when I was on this site, there was one and it was night. And I forget, I forget the city, but they turned down this narrow back alley. I'm like, don't go, go, don't go, go in the alley. No, what are you doing? It's like the horror, horror movie horror. world. Like, don't go down the no, alley. I was like, there is no way in hell I would have mm -hmm. even looked down that. I would have gone across the street. It was one of those alleys where you'd go across the street to not pass by that mm -hmm. alley. And this person, God bless them, they're just like, they're giving you the real experience. Like, yeah. Like, oh, it like call 911 or whatever the local number is. If, yeah. if this and is I'm just like, like midstream. Well, and Christian. Cool. Christian wanted to know why you picked Soul. So was if there was something specific about Soul, other than, as we know, like K-pop is a huge yeah. thing. I'm assuming someplace in South Korea, but I don't know if there was something specific about Seoul that was like, this is the one I want to explore. Because that's not the only city I think that you mentioned that's in Korea, but it's been a couple yeah, yeah. A month at least since I've read it. So if there's another city, my brain's not pulling it out. Yeah. So in part because Seoul is, it just looks absolutely fascinating. Um, it, you know, I've watched... For the research, I watched so many vlogs and travel guides and um, a day in the life of and come with me as I eat through Seoul and all sorts of things. Um, oh, oh, my gosh. It looks so great. But <laughs> mostly it was because of the plot. So um, when she goes to Seoul, it's to visit him and he's a K-pop idol. So he's working in Seoul. Um, so it's just kind of like that's where it had to be. That's That's where he's located. That's where he lives. Yeah, and and I didn't know if there were others because I don't know enough about K-pop to know like okay, is Seoul the city of K-pop or if there's like another side like okay, so for American music, okay, sure, L.A. but maybe Nashville, but that's again a certain type of music. I'm way too American in this interview. I don't. I, <laughs> well, I just you're a California girl. Be quiet for, a minute. Yeah. for most of the, like the big companies, that's where they're going to be located. Yeah, like when I think K-pop, I don't think a little tiny village. Someplace. Well, I didn't think a tiny village, but <laughs> like Seoul's the only the only city. But I haven't visited. My sister got to go a few years back, obviously before the pandemic, when travel was still a thing. And you know, she she went there with her her husband and her extended family, and it was her first time. I think it was her first time traveling abroad at all because I can't remember her going before then. She did not go with me to Brazil. So That's like Ari, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, where are we going? And all this stuff. But she was with everyone who's other than her children. Everyone there also spoke the language, which makes yeah. a big difference versus yeah. Ari doesn't speak Korean. <laughs> exactly. she doesn't. And it makes so like, but, you know, um, when she's looking around, she's there. She goes like she meets up with her cousin and Jihoon's there and they're able to like having someone from the city show you around. It's just such a different experience than you with your travel guidebook and your GPS going like. I yeah. don't know. Like, your dog eared lonely planet yeah. where you're just like, yeah. I think the museum's here down someplace. Well, and I haven't done nearly as much travel as I'd like, and I mostly blame my my children. It's not their fault. I just I did some traveling earlier and then things have happened in life and I haven't gotten to go as many places as I'd like to. But I am happy that I've I've only been to Hawaii once, but I've never done the tourist Hawaii thing because the one time I went, I was staying in a church fellowship hall with people oh. who lived there. And I was, you know, at the time I was a vegetarian. So the number of times spam showed up, I'm like, still can't eat it. I'll stick with the rice this time. Thank you very much. <laughs> spam was everywhere. I did not know. Nobody Ugh. told me. By the way, spam is basically the national cuisine of Hawaii. And yes, I know it's a state. You know what I mean? State cuisine. It's the state cuisine of Hawaii. And it was it was awesome because the things I got to see were the high school my friend went to and driving wow. through the neighborhoods and stuff and hearing a bit of pigeon, which I didn't know existed because no one teaches kids in California anything to learn a bit, a bit more. And if I had gone as a tourist or on a honeymoon, I would have seen like 
the stage play version of it. I wouldn't have actually gotten to experience. So yeah, I was there in a time when I was on the beach in jeans and a sweatshirt because it was cold, but I'm like, I'm in Hawaii. I'm going on the beach. I don't care that I'm freezing (laughs) and shivering. I will be here for at least five minutes to say I did it. Yeah. I think you have to. to. That is also the law. You will do that. If the ocean's anywhere near you, you've got to at least like physically lay eyes on it. And I'm like nerdy California. when I travel. No, I don't. Yeah, it's but there. I don't need to go again. I like to always see like different bodies of water. Like I'm like, oh, I get to. I've seen the Adriatic Sea. You know, I it was. I like beaches. I love beaches. Yeah. I like beaches, but growing up by one, I'm like, I'm aware of it to the point where one of the houses I lived in, I could see the beach from my living room and you just kind of get over it at some point. Wow. Rub that yeah. in. Huh? I know. I'm like, I oh. love it. But the yeah, funny that thing sounds is, terrible. I know. Well, so that place was amazing. I'm still mad that I don't live there anymore. But my eldest, she pulled a full Anakin Skywalker and it's like, there's too much sand everywhere. I'm like, it's the beach. What did you think? So we did not hit a lot of beaches once she made that perfectly clear that she's like the water is cold and there's sand like, i don't i don't know what she thought it would be like wow. a giant hot tub with i can live on a beach absolutely yeah, me too and i think i think I, i'm in new england so here it's dark and cold and the yeah. the water is freezing and full of haunted ghosts yeah and full of haunted ghosts and shipwrecks um but yeah i just i've love i love the beach love the ocean try to make a point if i'm traveling to get there like see the water yep touch it touch it i don't i stuck my hand in the i was in iceland this june and i stuck my hand in the water there and i'm like oh that is very cold (laughs) now you know because you put your hand in yep (laughs) well and it's funny though because i don't actually know how warm or cold the world the water in iceland would be you'd think it's cold but i didn't know and and this was something actually some people who maybe are in the middle of the country don't think about the water is cold in california because our water comes down from alaska it's not warm here most of the time my mother who was raised in pennsylvania and used to go down to like the uh, you know the Jersey Shore and the water there was warm because the water's coming up from the Gulf of Mexico. First time she gets out here, she's like, "What the heck is wrong with California? Why are the beaches so cold? This is terrible." So I'm <laughs> sure my daughter, who is named after my mother, just inherited that in- that, uh, that lack of appreciation for the California beaches. Yeah, I am one of those people who, when I went to California for the first time and saw the ocean, I thought. It must be warm. It doesn't look warm, but it must be. And I jammed my hand in it, of course. And I was like, that's cold. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So I want to talk. I was going to say something earlier and then we got off track and then I was surfing for a while through the memories of Beach's past. The The relationship with Ari and her sister, again, I felt like you were mining my head and my life because I also, she's probably not watching. Hi, if you are my sister, um, a, a sister who maybe didn't follow parental expectations and mm-hmm. then the younger sister going, oh, I guess I'm doubling down with all of the expectations on it. Mm-hmm. And just for anyone watching, I will, I will clarify that my sister later graduated with honors from UCLA and she's, she is amazing. But there were some years there where the idea of her doing what our parents wanted was like, oh, you can't make me. I'm not gonna. I feel like I really related to Ari's sister, like the whole time. <laughs> I'm just like, child yeah. ever. <laughs> I know, but I really like, like that character that vibe. <laughs> yeah, I like. She just seemed like, um, if you just seems like the, that friend that's always doing something super cool. Yeah, like you know, when she takes a when she's on a, a train or something, she's sitting next to like the film director, yes, or totally. you know, when she goes out for a drink to the bar. Um, the guy she's next to was a spy. Like she just seems like one of those people that's able to kind of connect with interesting people because she's very open to possibility. So she gets invited to the after party. That's she, all there is. She's, she's the, the, the one who gets to go to the cool thing afterwards. Yes. Where you know either Ari couldn't go out because uh, she's got to work, so she didn't go yeah. out at all. Or if she did, she had the one drink. She was there. She came. She saw. She went home again without really anyone there. there. She or, didn't know or what it was. It. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted her, I basically wanted Phoebe to be the um the foil of like someone who was very open to experience and opportunity compared to someone who was very close. who has a travel journal but doesn't travel. <laughs> yeah. Who had who's scared, like you know, scared yeah. and um had narrowed her life instead of broadened her life. Oh yeah. 
And just even the idea of later discussions with how her parents perceive both of them. And there's those discussions and then even discussions with the parents. It's one of those things. I know at one point my sister and I both were like, we both were convinced that the other one was our parents' favorite. And I know my mother's like, what kind of a terrible mother am I that both of my children think the other one is their favorite? But the reason was, I know for me, like I felt like nothing I ever did was good enough and, and she could get away with anything. And she's kind of like, they don't expect anything from me. So they've already kind of given up on me. They they expect a lot from you. So therefore, yeah. you know, they, they you're the one that they think is amazing. And both of us were like, how come we're not feeling this? And so much of that just made me realize now that I'm a parent, I always want to make sure my kids recognize just like, you're all going to be different and you're going to want to do different things. And I want to love and support you in the way you are. But like the, the internalized competitiveness, even for affection and approval is like, dude, this is why everything in the Bible is, is sibling rivalry and killing each other and stealing birthrights. And it's, it's just like, maybe, maybe Jen's right. She should just be only, only children all the way. That's me. <laughs> Are you an only and child too? I am. You wrote it so well. Do you have, do you have friends with siblings that you sat there with your little, your little author journal and say, yeah, like yes. everybody's got a sibling. Like, Tell me about your trauma. You know, yes. I was yes. the, when I was growing up, I think I was the only one who was an only child. Yeah. I think um, I had, another best friend growing up who was an only child and we like were like obsessed with each other when we were kids because it was like you're my sister yeah. like, and I think <laughs> when you're an only child you kind of turn all of your friends into family I just I find sibling relationships fascinating like in a, a family environment like they are so interesting to me because I didn't yeah I didn't have to experience that so um everything about it is like my husband comes from a large family and I'm always like wow that's so yeah. interesting. That's what you guys did, huh? That's how you worked out. I see. I see. I mean, in our family right now, it's constantly me having to buy all new toothbrushes because the youngest one can't stop messing with everybody else's toothbrushes. Like, that's not a thing that when you're an only child, you have to worry yeah. about because no one's no. messing with your stuff. Nope. You know? Nope. Yeah, not that I grew up with that. My sister and I were far too civilized for that kind of stuff. I just was usually <laughs> getting picked on and then responding with physical violence. And yeah, you know, it's all good. Yeah, as an only child, there's like nobody to blame when you do something wrong, though. Mm -hmm. And and board games are kind of weird to play because you're like, I guess I'll just play Monopoly by myself, but I'll like play two different roles and I'll just solitaire. kind of like solitaire. I used Walk. to, yeah, reading. solitaire for reading. hours, reading, reading. Stop reading, thank God. Yeah, I know. Thank I just. I remember being a kid and my parents' friends were like, is there something wrong with Jennifer? Like, she's always reading. Like, why doesn't she go outside? And I'm like, look at how pale my skin is. I can't I go outside. I'm going to catch a fire. You don't well, have enough melanin. Have to, to, like, play people to play with. Yeah. Like, there was always someone to play with. I was like, well, now i got to go to somebody's house. Yeah. Like, Hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then the, know, so the play. dynamic is when you have siblings who won't play with you, you get screaming children because they don't want to play with you because you're the only boy and they really don't want to play trains anymore because they're older girls. Or in my case, my sister was just like way too cool to deal with me. So, you know, either way, you're like, great rejection, even in my own house. Thank you so very, very much. Okay, I like guess when you're at home alone, really, you're like, that book like, is never rejecting me. A totally sad only child play incident. So when I was young, uh, if you had a sibling and you had like tennis rackets, you could just bat a ball back and forth with another person. I had a ball on an elastic band that was attached to a weight that I would stand in the driveway and just hit by myself until uh, I hit it too hard and the elastic snapped and then I have to go running across the street to get it and then I have to retie it back on. All <laughs> I got very good at, you know, I didn't even think about the elastic band trick. I should have, but it was just chucking a ball at the garage door. Yeah, the garage yeah, door. We had a garage door. We had a carport. Oh no! Was, that's no, why you needed the band. That's why you no, needed no the garage elastic. door. <laughs> that's okay. And Christian, Christian wants to know what the hardest part of the book was to write. And I won't guess. You gotta, you gotta tell us what the hardest part. If you, if you say it's something that happens later, you can just do this and tell us quietly. How um, <laughs> what was the hardest part? I think the hardest part was getting, huh, that's a really good question because in the thinking back hardest part, I don't think was actually the hardest part in the moment, if that makes sense. Like I think in the moment, 
the hardest part is the ending because I'm like, get it done, get it done. Let's go. And, and, you know, I just want to get it all out. Uh, and then you have to go back and edit it. But when I think oh, pesky back, editing, yeah, <laughs> like fix it and post. Um, <laughs> but when I think back, I think the emotional scenes between Ari and her sister were actually some of the hardest to write. Hmm. But in like in the moment, it didn't seem like that. But thinking back, it does. I don't know. It's weird because you would think like the in the moment hardest part would be the looking back hardest part. But I don't think it was. No. Okay. Are you someone then who is one of those really organized plotter people? I, I don't understand. Okay, good. Because okay, we're good. I'm wearing a dress right now because it's hot and uh, I'm a, I'm a pantser even when I'm wearing a dress because <laughs> you know. I was. I, have to I, say, was, I, yeah. I interviewed somebody else today, and he talked about how he, like, he spends like over a month just doing an outline. And I was like, "Oh, whoa!" I went to a <laughs> workshop with a Canadian horror writer who's really famous. So I'm like, whatever he says, I'm going to do because, like, I love this guy's work. He's incredible. And then he went through his plotting process, and my eyeballs were just honestly on stocks at how <laughs> complex it was. It was like. It took ages and he thought through every single detail of his, you know, pretty complex books. Um, and I totally get it because, you know, he has to make sure it all matches. And I was just like, I'm not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> like, after a while, this sounds like that. Like success to, you know, not have to do that. Mm -mm, no. What's funny is I always think like when I talk to authors who outline and they know what's going to gonna happen in their book and I always think oh maybe it's easier to write that way I think like, when you know what you're going to do and then when I try to outline I just like have a panic attack I'm like okay, oh my god you outlined literally yesterday I did outline yesterday and but not the whole book panic attack? but did you no. have a panic attack no but maybe I feel like for you yeah. is you just can't do the whole thing at once. And exactly. I think if I outline right. chunks of the book, it would be yeah. fine because I still don't know how it's going to end. Well, we were laughing because <laughs> I was writing a synopsis on a book that I wasn't even done with. And I'm like, who am I? And she's over there outlining. I'm like, this is totally weird. It's like Freaky Friday where we're we're <laughs> doing things that would never normally happen for us. But sometimes they help. And I, I know for I me, it, though, when you said something about like, it's not necessarily in the moment, but looking back, you're like, oh, that actually was the hardest part. I get that. And sometimes it's because I end up going forward and forward until I don't know which way to go. And then I yeah. keep going forward and then something just clicks and then it ends up being easier than you think it's going to be a part that was going to be hard. So in retrospect, the part that didn't seem like it should have been so hard was the hardest part, but you can't yeah. really analyze that. So you're done and you go, why was that such a mess? You know what? You said something so interesting and this. I think this is my biggest fear because you said something just clicks and my fear is one day it's not going to click. Yes. <laughs> my fear is that one day. Fear. I'm writing because right now I'm just like, it'll work out. Uh, <laughs> because it always has. And then I put myself in a corner. I go for a six hour long walk or whatever. And then I will see a bird or what, mm -hmm. like just something triggers a thought. And I'm like, oh, that's how it has to go. And my ultimate fear is that one day I'm not seeing that bird. That that bird doesn't show up. That bird does not show yeah. up. And, and I just go back I'm like, ooh. <laughs> I'm not there. And I guess the thing is, it, it's one of those things I know for me, when it does click, it's just so obvious. And so, so like, right now, I don't know how my book is ending. And I joke, maybe one of the reasons, since I write rom-coms and I write speculative fiction. And the nice thing about rom-coms is I know how it has to end because the couple's got to be together or people yeah. will come and kill me. Yeah. So that makes that easier. Where, where speculative fiction, everything is on the table, like literally everything. Yeah. And so you're weighing different ways. Now, obviously with a rom-com, you're figuring out, well, how is it the most satisfying way for them to get together? But you at least know your end point know, is you know, know, that's, together. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like if, you're, if your book ended, and so I'm going to spoil the ending here, that the couple wasn't together, you know, everybody would be going, oh. Boo! Yeah. Because it's a rom com, and I, I will, I, yeah. I have a few friends who are like, well, you know, romance doesn't need to have a happily ever after, yes, and I'll just clarify. Yes, no, it technically it does. does. The genre of romance needs yep. it. Yes, and you may have a drama with a romantic storyline with love interest that does not end in a happy ending, and that that's is fine. Right. But we don't call them romance. Right. Totally. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why right. Romeo and Juliet is a love story and not a romance, and it's called a tragedy. And it's not a rom com. Not even Baz Luhrmann's version where everybody's like all exciting, <laughs> bright colors. That's 
John Leguizamo funny, but not a rom com. <laughs> yep. Anyway, the, the but I think that that's the thing is like if it doesn't click for you and you don't know where that end is or you don't know where that big spark's gonna come, you can just sit there going, uh, how much further yeah. am I gonna go? What am I gonna do? And you have to kind of be able to get to the point where you go, all right. I'm going to put something down. And if this isn't the moment that clicks, it will come. And if I need to delete this part earlier, I, I joke that my, the reason I'm a pantser is I've got pockets in my pants and I have like the editing scissors in there that I can just snip out things. <laughs> Cause I, at this point I have something like, okay, I think I might know where something's happening, but I may have revealed it too early. So I might need to snip it out there yeah. and put it over here. And that's why the pockets have the pants to put yeah. that <laughs> line in there and move it to later. Oh, that being said, my next book, I'm going to try plotting. Wish me luck. I love it. You know, We're I, all doing things that we try never it. would do. <laughs> I think you try it, and if it doesn't work for you, you know that you can pants too. Like it's it's yeah. not we're none none of us are limited in any one process. Yeah. And if it works for you, great. And the moment it doesn't start start working, you just you pivot. You try something else yeah. and go. Okay, we're trying this over here, and it's just a more people like it. Like it. <laughs> and I'm like, and for efficiency's sake, I'm going to give it a shot. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking. I was like, I think. And, you know, so I outlined six whole chapters yesterday and then I wrote the first one and I was like, wow, that was fast. Yes. Like, because I, I knew what I was doing instead of just going, hmm, let's see what pops out of my fingers. Chapter three, though, and then it's just going to start going this way. Yeah. Well, and then that, that's some people like they go, oh, well, but how how do you do that? And then not feel like you're being hemmed in. And then I know people who are plotters who are going, I write this outline and then I don't go back to it ever again. But um, the process of the outline got the creative process going for them so that when they started, they had the confidence yeah. to go. And then the freedom to say, here's where I'm going to leave the outline behind. And maybe I'm going to come yeah. back to it over here. But yeah. maybe in that process, they found something. So there, there's, I guess, what, the planters? It's a funny yeah. word. Yeah. But okay, so if you're saying expedience, does that mean you have something else in the works that you have a deadline and there's an editor looking over your shoulder going, Lily, give us book? I, I do. So I'm currently working on uh, the my third book with Audible and source books. Um, and that's due at the end of the month. So, oh, we, so no, no pressure. And it's it's, fine. it's the only month. the fifth. You have so much time. <laughs> it. I finished. Um, so I handed in, then I had to do some revisions. I finished those the other day. So now I'm into like the refining process of the edits and mm -hmm. I also need to probably trim down around 10,000 words um yep. which means full chat like when you're at that point it's like a lot you have to go and you're like yeah that's yeah. not tightening language anymore that's not tightening that's language that's, I know that's just like I guess we don't need out. chapter nine yeah. <laughs> that's, well, that's not the search to replace for just still you know thigh yeah. or whatever that's that chapter's got to go yeah, that plot line has to go. Mm -hmm. so. I I just oh. turned in my book to my agent, and I was doing a rewrite of it, and she was like, "You need to cut ten thousand words." And so I was there. I had like whole chapters highlighted that was like, yeah. "I don't think I need it." And then I'm like rereading it, and I'm like, "It's just pretty words, but I don't, I don't need it." Like and it. delete. Oh. <laughs> don't you find that when it's gone, you don't even notice? Yeah, like, when I reread it, I was like. Yeah. Was that where there? was that chapter that yeah. I cut? I didn't even know where it was. Yep. Like, I couldn't <laughs> even know where it was. Leftovers, no. so it, it, it's not gone completely. So emotionally, okay. I feel like I feel yeah. better about it. Um, <laughs> do you save your stuff, Lily, if you cut something? Do, oh, my God. Do you, my So number one, the other thing I have to do besides trying plotting is get a much better file naming system <laughs> because my file naming <laughs> system is so bad like for this book because I go through um whenever I do a change or something I usually re resave the file if that makes sense and yeah. then I keep going from there because I don't want to do major edits just in case I go back there so yeah. it's stuff like honestly dead you know attempt 46 revision infinity you know they're all just and then I go back to what I do. Where was that? <laughs> I just date them all. I date them all. And like every couple of days, too. I say, I do like title and then the date and sometimes and then I always send it to myself an email and I will not call out my friend who this happened to. It was not Jen. So this is not on Jen. I had a friend who had finished a book and her computer crashed and she lost the book. And she had not, she had not sent it to me. And she often sends stuff to me in progress. She, she lost pretty much everything on the computer. One thing no. she had sent a copy, another one she had. I'm like, you are now no. always required to send me stuff 
every day. I yeah. don't care. I won't read it unless you tell me to, but I need, you know, you need to be the backup and I need to be your redundancy yeah. in case you have a your email. It's being stupid. So I will usually, I'm like, I send it to her and I save it myself. I'll send it to my husband. I know he's not reading it. He doesn't read the books I've actually published. So they're safe. <laughs> It's like a locked vault, but still that's like, awful. oh, yeah. That would be, that's it. Like that book would be done because I, like, no I guess that's way I can rewrite it. It's just, yeah, it's just gone. Too. It yeah. was just an exercise. In, it was. Yeah. yeah you would have to no, think in self -loathing? that. Self-loathing? In self-loathing. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but she is pressing forward, but she is also one of those people who does multiple projects. So she is currently delaying by writing like seven other books. So oh. eventually, hopefully one of them will be finished and I will get to read it. But I don't function that as long way. As it's saved. Yeah. As long as it's yeah. saved, it's, it's fine. But I'm, I'm one every day, title and the date, title and the date and save it, and save it. And I don't care if by the time it's done, there's like 800 of them. Yeah. Each one is slightly yeah. adjusted. And even if I added three words, it's a new document. <laughs> Yeah. See, I it's I do the like, like naming. Yeah, my yeah. list is like final, real final, yeah. actual final, final two, final V two, final V two, <laughs> final. With, yeah. Then it's like final edited final, and I'm like, yeah. oh no, oh. no. I don't fool myself to think anything's ever final. Like, why why lie to myself that way? I'll just be more disappointed mm -hmm. when it's not like this wasn't actually the final. And then when you have to go for it later, and you find wait, this wasn't the final. There's a more final than this final, and then you don't even know what that one's called yeah. other than just like Armageddon draft. You know, like Armageddon no. draft. That's, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, my big problem is that sometimes you know you wrote a sentence or a paragraph, you're like, that was gold. That was gold. <laughs> and it, it's somewhere back in a draft you wrote four months ago. And so you have to go through all those stupid drafts mm -hmm. to try to find that one, like, you know, you're kind of like searching for the one word you think is in that amazing I was say, Do you remember one word from that gold? Yeah. You're like, oh, it had the word, word something like the muse or something. <laughs> like stand. Yeah. And then it's like 40 different words. Like, no, no, no. no. Mm -mm, mm -mm, no, that would drive me bonkers. It uh, that's what I've been doing. So it did drive me bonkers. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> it actually did really, um, really. Drive. And then I was like, maybe I didn't write. Maybe that I dreamt it. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> and I I didn't actually. And what happens when you find the sentence and you're like, oh, I guess it wasn't that good. Oh, that's devastating. Oh, huh. okay. yeah, because okay, I've done, I've that. done that too. Also, like when you're asked for a blurb or a snippet for something and you're looking for like that golden section and you finally read it, you're like, mm, that's not that good. maybe that's not the, the best. But, Is there anything in here good? <laughs> I hope something <laughs> in here and somebody will go, yeah, that's the sentence. But yeah. I never put, but never put on the spotlight for that. I'm almost always like, like, <laughs> No. Oh, me too. Yeah. <laughs> well, Lily, we are excited that you were here with us today. I loved the book. Very fun. So everybody who is watching now or on the replay, make sure you head over to Audible and get the comeback um, and check out Lily's other work as well. And we will definitely have you back when your next book comes out. I love that. And oh, I should put the hat back on. So I end in style. I'll oh, put your hat back on. Oh, do I have to put my put glasses back on? Put the sunglasses back on. Dark um, so here. thank you so much, Lily, for being here with us. Thank you, Allison. Yes, look at us. We are very, very cool. Stay tuned for next week when we are going to be talking to David Slayton and his Hillbilly Warlock series. We're going to be talking about <laughs> that. Is that it? White Trash Warlock. It's, that it's White Trash Warlock. I'm not and sure then, if you describe it as a hillbilly. Yeah. But there's, I knew there's it. I, was, I said it wrong. I'm like, nope, there was no alliteration there. Yeah. David R. Slayton. It's the ad, it, Technically, it's called the Adam Binder series, but I'm sure. I want to say White Trash things. Warlock instead. Look up White Trash Warlock. You'll find him. It's good. <laughs> So thank you all, and we will see you next Wednesday night. Thank you. Afternoon. Bye. Bye.